Shalom Rabbi, and thank you for taking the time for this part of my program, Profiles of Faith. We are here today, February 1st, 16th of Shvat, with Rabbi Saul Berman at his home in New York City. Rabbi, how do you prefer to be called? Whatever you prefer. Saul is fine. Saul. About Rabbi Berman, Rabbi Saul Berman has a long and illustrious record in many fields. As a pulpit rabbi in Berkeley, California, in Brooklyn, Massachusetts, and Lincoln Square, New York, where I first met you in 1984. As a scholar, you mastered rabbinic studies, law studies, and political science. You are a contributor to Encyclopedia Judaica, an author of Jewish law books, and numerous articles over many years of countless publications. You are famous for writing on the subject of halacha in contemporary society, on issues regarding women's role in modern orthodoxy, and a lot more. As a social activist, having actively participated in the civil rights movement, where you were present at the demonstration in Selma, Alabama in 1965, an early leader in the Soviet Jewry movement, and acting from women's standing in Judaism as part of the Da and other efforts. As a teacher, besides creating several community-based study programs, you were the chairman of the Department of Judaic Studies in Stern College for Women of Yeshiva University, where you're currently an associate professor, as well as an adjunct professor at Columbia University School of Law. Together with your wife, Shelley, you raised four children, and how many grandchildren? Eight so far. Baruch Hashem. Yes, Hashem. Rabbi, this is a long list of accomplishments, and it is impossible to cover it all within the short time we have. And before I ask you how you managed to do it all in one lifetime, let me start some basic questions. My theme is about tradition and its transmission through the generation. You are an important link in this chain. Can you tell us about your family and where you grew up? So I grew up in uh, Bed-Stuy in New York, in Brooklyn. And uh, my parents had both been born in, in Europe and came to the United States. My mother in her late teens, my father in his mid-twenties. Um, my father had been learning in Slabatka uh, in, in Europe for many years before he came to the United States. Um, my mother's father uh, was um, a Rav in, in Lita and then became a Rav here in, in New York. Um, so the influences within my home were, were largely sort of Lithuanian. Uh, halacha in our home was based on the Orach HaShulchan. Um, my, my father, Zechat Tzadik Levracha, was uh, an extraordinarily sensitive Bal Musar. Um, and, and from him I learned uh, very early that you have to recognize the truth of ethical teachings even as aspirations when you don't feel that you can actually fulfill them. But you have to know what you're striving for. Kadma, uh, Torah, Derech Eretz, the Torah, right? No, no, it's a different issue. It's an issue of, of uh, understanding that there are ideals that you have to aspire to, um, uh, you know, even when your life circumstances don't fully allow you to achieve them. Having a goal besides fulfilling Allah. Exactly. And, you know, in, in that, sort of environment, I, I you know, grew up, I, I flourished. What was his goal? His goal was just to teach Torah. He was a Rav in, in a shul in Bed-Stuy. It was the last shul in the neighborhood that remained open. He battled for uh, years to keep it open as long as he possibly could. What years could were keep that? Going. They were there until the late 60s. It was, as I said, the last shul in the neighborhood that remained open. He was able to walk through the streets himself because, as he told me at one point, the, the black ministers in the neighborhood used to warn their teenage kids that if they started up with the old rabbi, that they would burn in hell forever. And so he could walk through the streets when no one else could safely. Um, and, and so he stayed as long as there was a minion still, still possible to be had. I wish we, we could have all the religious leaders tell their congregants in any religion right. that they'll burn in hell if they do wrong. But yeah. I don't think it works very well. I mean, well. it was an important lesson for, for me. I mean, many years later in the, uh, in, in the in 1969 to 71, when I was the rabbi at, at the Young Israel of Brookline, uh, one of the things that I was able to, to work on was the creation of an, of an interreligious uh, effort to create um, community patrols that consisted of both Orthodox Jews and blacks from Dorchester, Mattapan, 
um, in order to provide greater safety and protection for Jews who had remained in Dorchester, Mattapan, when the rest of the Jewish community had moved out to, uh, to, to Brookline and to Newton. To better grazing fields. Okay, uh, you know, neighborhoods keep changing yeah. and people keep l being left behind yeah. and, and the community needs to always realize right. that it's not appropriate to just leave people behind, uh, that we have a responsibility for right. them that needs to be taken seriously, but that that can best be achieved usually through those kinds of, of interreligious and, and interracial efforts. Can you tell us, please, about yourself as a child and who were the influential people in your life? As a child. Well, so I started my education at the Yeshiva of Brooklyn, um, which was then located in Bed-Stuy and moved many, many years later to Flatbush. Uh, but Rabbi uh, Mandel was then the, the principal, and, and he was just a wonderful, warm person. I transferred early on into Yeshiva Torah Vadas, and I remained in Yeshiva Torah Vadas through most of my grade school and, and my high school education. Um, and, and there, I, you know, many of my lifelong friends were made in, in, in Tervadas. I had the opportunity in my last year at the yeshiva to study with Rav Pam. Um, yeah. I had a warm relationship with Rav Quinn, uh, with Rav Shore. But th I, I can't say that they were really primary influences uh, in my, my religious development. Uh, I was a member of Purchei Godes Yisrael at that time. And, and you know, uh, while my parents loved um, Israel and, and loved Eretz Yisrael, and I had an uncle living at that time in, in Israel, uncle and aunt and cousins. Um, the, the, the dominant influences in my religious life, uh, uh, other than my father, really came later in my life. So you mentioned that you had sentiment for Israel because at the time Zionism and Agudat Israel didn't go hand in hand exactly. That's right. I mean, I was the president of my local Pirche chapter and, and the membership card of the Pirche chapter on the back had the principles of Pircha Agudas Yisrael, included in which was we are opposed to the existence of a secular state in the land of Israel. Uh, so I grew up in that environment, but knowing that uh, that wasn't the whole picture, despite... Two, two out of three ain't bad. <laughs> you agreed with some, yes, but not with, with all. Not with yeah. all. Your influences were at home, were outside, were rabbinics. My religious influences were primarily within, within the family. My grandfather... My mother's father had passed away uh, when I was very young, um, but he was he and and his teaching and values were a living part of my growing up, uh, partly through my mother and partly through a, a safer of, of his writings that um, that, that my uh, father and, and had worked on and, and had published, um, and and otherwise it was primarily really my my father. Um, as a religious influence and the community of, of people with whom I with whom I grew up. I heard stories from Rabbi Riskin with whom yeah. you were friends early on. Can you take us to your adventures together and to your Jewish life at the time in the neighborhood? Well, I mean, the neighborhood was built around the, you know, for, for us kids, was built around the Yeshiva of Brooklyn, um, and the, uh, the catering hall that was right next door to the Yeshiva of the Brooklyn, um, which supported our Pirche group, which was a major force in our, in our lives. So we used to hang out in, in the yeshiva on, on Shabbatot because that's where the Pirche met. And, um, and, and then on Matsoi Shabbos, we would have a lava de Malka at the yeshiva with food left over from the smorgasbord from the wedding hall right next door. The you raided it? Uh, no, they, they voluntarily used to bring in the, uh, the, the remaining into the Pirche, the, the, the caterer uh, used to send in food so that the, uh, so that the kids should have, uh, yeah. have, have leftover food rather than they're just throwing it out. So between you and Rabbi Riskin, who was the more rascal and who was the more uh, rabbinic well, early on? I, you know, early on, I, I don't know which he would say, but I, I would say that I was more adventurous uh, at, at that point in time. And, um, uh, but, but we had a wonderful relation. We had a wonderful chevra of, of kids in the neighborhood and, any, and we any hung out together. Any good, interesting stories? No. You know, almost... Uh, None worth telling. <laughs> <laughs> and who were your heroes in the Torah, as, in, the, in, in the Bible as a child and now, and people who inspired you? Uh, I, you know, um, I can't really say that... that um, that biblical figures in my early life 
uh, were, were really significant shaping forces for me. And later Again, on? Later on, it, it clearly became Moshe. Moses. Moses was an extremely important figure for me, in part because of the sequence of narratives that the Torah tells in that very short passage, consisting of seven verses in, in the book of Exodus, um, when the Torah tells us the way in which uh, Moshe conducted himself when he left the palace of the king, at which point Moshe realizes that his life is going to be at stake. And in fact, um, Paro hears about it, uh, starts searching for Moshe, Moshe flees. And then the last three psukim are the description of Moshe out in the desert in Midian. And, uh, and there he comes upon another scene of injustice in which he sees uh, a group of shepherds preventing some shepherdesses from watering their, flocks, watering their flocks. We're not even told why they were doing that, um, but we're, we're told that Moshe um, uh, intervened. And it's striking because one would have assumed that at that point Moshe must have had a small either angel or devil figure standing on his shoulder, pulling on his ear, saying to him, Moshe, you used to be a prince in Egypt, now you're a poor, wandering, you know, guy, in, <laughs> right? And it's because you kept sticking your nose into other people's business. Yeah, Don't mix in. Don't mix in. And Moshe resists that. The Torah doesn't even tell us how he achieved that intervention, but it says that he saved them. And that has always seemed to me to be a framework for a notion of Jewish responsibility. And that, that's why Hashem chose Moshe. And that's why Moshe represents that in the whole of the... Of, of the Torah. You obviously, many people admire Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, mm -hmm. but do you think that a lot of people think about his uh, self-sacrifice and his willingness to let go of his status in their view of Jewish leadership and what it should say to them about their life as a Jew? Well, look, I, I think that generally the, the religious community has sort of lost sight of the centrality of the Torah's teaching of the duty of rescue. And that is, you know, everybody knows that, that, that we have duties to help. But the notion that the Torah sort of uniquely in the, in the whole of history, in the whole of the history of legal systems in the world, that the Torah insists that you don't only have a duty not to do wrong. You don't only have a duty not to kill or not to injure or, or not to cause people financial loss. But you have to actively... But you have an active duty of rescue in situations in which other people are under threat and you have the capacity to intervene, to rescue them, that you have that legal duty of rescue. It appears in Torah repeatedly. It appears in regard to saving of life. It appears in regard to rescue of health, to the rescue of property, like as in Hashavat Veda, as a return of lost property. It appears in regard to emotional life, in regard to spiritual life, and every fundamental dimension of human existence. The Torah attempts to teach us that it's not enough just not to do wrong, that you have to attempt to help people. And uh, you know, it seems to me that that core message is already there in that, in that process of the selection of Moshe, and it's truly there already from Sefer Breshit, from the book of Genesis, in the whole of the lives of our ancestors, of Avram and Sarah and Yitzhak and Rivka and, and, and Yaakov and Rachel and Leah, this notion that there's a, a duty to help others, to rescue others. Well, the whole purpose of being a Jew and the Jewish people is Tikkun Olam and Or Lagoim, and if we didn't exist, we wouldn't have a problem, but being here is for the purpose of intervention. But I have an important question in that regard. We see that the state of Israel represents actually, even it's in its secular state, to accomplishing a lot more of Torah duties than all of the religious people. So I would think that the state of Israel, through its uh, embattlement and, and even the principle of not leaving a soldier behind, is doing a lot of sacred Jewish Torah mitzvah of saving people. I, I and, think and that's absolutely true. It's not that this duty of rescue is the totality of Torah or is its only goal. It's clear that, that the design of Torah is to get us to both create a society and to impact on the, whatever society within which we live in a way that both creates sort of foundational values 
that are lived within the family, that are lived within the community, that are lived within the society as a whole, and that are carried to outsiders and to strangers, and thereby to the entire world. That each of those levels is vital. It's not that one of those levels is all that there is. And for the community to retreat into a singular um, sort of withdrawn state in which the only thing that is important is the preservation of its own families and its own local community is, I believe, a limitation that in and of itself is not evil, but it's a limitation which prevents us from achieving the broader goals that Torah wants us to achieve. So I understand that there are moments in Jewish history when that becomes necessary. I think that the time immediately after the Holocaust, the process of, of, of religious communities attempting to rebuild and understanding that after the loss of six million Jews, after the loss of its central educational institutions, after the loss of, of, of its masters of Torah, that it became necessary to sort of withdraw in order to rebuild. But now it's time to But now, I, I think we, we are past the time already when it is necessary for us to be able to move out of that isolationism into a healthier and stronger sense that Torah wants us also out there in the real world, shaping the character of the society, even of the non-Jewish society within which we live, and of the world as a whole. What interests me in this whole phenomena is really the point of how the state of Israel mm -hmm. being secular, right. it's the irony yes. against all of the ultra from how the secular state of Israel has fulfilled and accomplished more yes. mitzvot of the Torah. Uh, we're not exactly the generation of Yeshua conquering Israel with the fervor of the Torah. Right. It's, you know, left-wing ex-socialist Jews and other survivors who built Israel in a seemingly secular way yes. and continues to use its secular ways to fulfill uh, sides of the Torah. Mm -hmm. And we forget that Rashid Gula is not by secular Jews. And mm -hmm. that is the irony. I'd like to hear more from you about that. Rabbi Cook, who was the, the first chief rabbi of, 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 of Palestine before the establishment of the state, um, tried to argue that there are two different forms of rebellion against Torah. There is a form of rebellion against Torah in which an individual recognizes that Torah wants to constrain um, fundamental elements of our passional lives. The fundamental drives that we share in common with all of animal life, right. the drive to eat what we want, the drive to have sex with whomever we want, the drive to, to, to injure people to right. our own desires, right. that all of those drives need to be constrained. Okay. And what Torah does is attempts to get us to constrain those drives precisely so that we should be able to build a more meaningful form of life built around affirmative values of goodness. The second form of rebellion, he argued, was when someone is unable to find in Torah the kind of spiritual life that they yearn for. He believed that people have a natural yearning for a deeply spiritual life, that people really in, in a very deep and profound way, want to live a life of values, want to live a life which recognizes transcendence, want to live a life of goodness in which their lives are built around the sense of helping others. And so Rav Cook said, there are people who, who are not able to find the expression of that spiritual yearning or the gratification of that spiritual yearning in Torah. That, he said, is not their fault. That's because we, the teachers of Torah, and we, the community of Torah, have not lived the Torah in a way that shows them that this is precisely the best way to achieve their spiritual yearning. And therefore, they turn to Buddhism, and they turn to this, and they turn to that. Right. It's a repetitive pattern in Jewish history. And so Rav Cook said, then, in relation to those people, we shouldn't condemn them. We should help them find their spiritual gratification Wherever within they... Torah because it ought to be found within Torah. Now, he then went on to argue as follows. He said, there are people who are building the material reality of the state of Israel who are in reality are engaged in a spiritual endeavor. They don't know it. 
They think that they're just satisfying the material needs. But in truth, they are building the foundation of a surge of spiritual awareness that will eventually encompass them as well. There are tools in the hands of a, a, a Rebun exactly. for the purpose of Torah, ultimately. So you, you're saying that the state of Israel is a manifestation of both um, the need for safety, obviously, mm -hmm. and the um, building of the infrastructure to serve future Jewish life, and also yes. seeking, because the socialists that were in Europe, what mm -hmm. we call the fire that took mm -hmm. over Europe and socialism that involved many Jews, mm -hmm. were actually a spiritual seekers that ultimately found their way to Israel and built Israel out of some ruach that that's, would serve Torah ultimately. That's correct. That's why Rav Kook argued in the order of the petitional section of the weekday Amidah, in the, in the order of those petitions, there, there, there are personal petitions and national petitions. The personal petitions are in the order of the spiritual preceding the material. Because as individuals, we need to be conscious of the need to build our spiritual lives so that they will be present for us in our material lives. But on the level of the nation, the national petitions, the material precede the spiritual because you need to build a secure material national foundation in order for the spiritual to flourish. It follows your father's uh, idea that you need to that's have right. a purpose in life. Exactly. That you need to have a sense of a vision that's going to carry you someplace, even when you can't fulfill it entirely in your own time. That's, I think one of the most important messages that we should put on bumper stickers if we find a way to put it in, uh, <laughs> in six words or less. But let's go back to your childhood because sure. um, that's where everything starts, right? Mm -hmm. When do you remember yourself feeling God independently for the first time and not as part of the education system or your parents? I cannot say that there was a particular moment when I felt that. But I, I, my father... Um, uh, used to, almost every year when he would speak from the pulpit on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, would always refer to the way in which the tefillot of, of generations of people had become embedded in the walls of the synagogue. And that therefore our tefillot, our prayers, would sort of pass through the prayers of the prior generations in order to reach out to God. Using the our the supportive ancestors, services, so to speak, the supportive services of our ancestors. It's how we ask for help. We also appeal to our ancestors to speak to be Malitza Yosha. That's right. So he was not big on the idea of sort of praying to our ancestors for them to intercede with God. He believed that we had the responsibility to relate directly to God, but that our prayers were in turn supported somehow by the prior existence and prior prayers of, of our ancestors, that in turn, that's what made it possible for God to respond to us. And so I, I always had the sense that, that God really hears our tefillot. But there were, there were peak moments in that. I mean, I, I remember, I, I must have been uh, I don't know, 14 or 15 years old. I was in high school in Tervadas. And, and Shlomo Riskin and, and a few other of, of us as kids had developed this practice of every Friday going to a small public library in our neighborhood. Uh, it was in the middle of Tompkins Park in Brooklyn. Um, and, and we would take out four books every Friday. And we would have a competition to see who could finish all four books by the next Friday. What kind of books? Uh, we took out whatever was there. Secular not, books. Secular books, Jewish books, whatever. They, they had a small Judaica collection, but it was mostly fiction, you know, sort of children's, first children's fiction and then teenagers' fiction and, and then some other, whatever the books were. They, they used to stamp, you know, four stamps in the back of the card so and then you would bring was, them back. And it, it was not it was, only a book club, it was a race book it was a, club. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, so I remember one time I came across um, a book by Ab Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, yes. whom I had never heard of before. I, you know, growing up at Tervadas, I had never heard of Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel. Um, and it was the book Man in Search of God. And, and I took it home, and that Shabbat, I remember it was, uh, it was a very long Shabbat afternoon. I went up 
to the room that I shared with my brother, and I lied myself down on, on my bed and started reading, and I felt myself sort of sucked into a transcendent experience and came out of it about three and a half hours later when I finished the book. And, and I rushed downstairs to my father. He was sitting at the table on Shabbat afternoon. And I said, Daddy, you have to, you have to read this. You have to read this. I've never not, seen anything like this. It was it's extraordinary. I did not like very much. No, I did, did not like very much. And my father, well, he read the New York Times every day. He never was comfortable speaking English, but he, he you know, read English well. He said, oh, let me take a look at it. And he recognized the name, of course, as the name of a chassidish, uh, you know, Rebbe. And, and so he, he sort of started reading it. And, and it was clear that after about 15 minutes, he was not in it. It did not reach his sort of litvisha you know, needs. And, and, and uh, he sort of commented after about uh, 15, 20 minutes, he said, so geflachtenwerte. It's like words woven together. It was like poetry. He saw that it was poetry. Well, Heschel and, was a poet. Yes, absolutely. You know, so it did not suck him in. But somehow it, it had sucked me in. It opened up an interesting path. It wasn't until much later that I met Rabbi Heschel. I met Rabbi Heschel when we were living in Berkeley in the 1960s when I was the rabbi of the, of the Orthodox Shul in Berkeley, and I was a graduate student there. And, um, and Rabbi Heschel was brought to the University of California at Berkeley twice every year uh, by Professor David Weiss, um, who was then a microbiologist at the University of California at Berkeley. He subsequently went on Aliyah. He used to bring Rabbi Heschel to Berkeley twice a year to meet with Jewish faculty members, and, and I was permitted to participate in that. He was a formidable Jew, and not exactly how people see him. He was a starker. People think that he was this liberal Jew. At the time, conservative Jews were not, as we think today of them, as doing less. They were formidable ideologists who he demanded was, a lot. I mean, I found him to be an absolutely extraordinary, you know, what can I say? I mean, I, nothing that I could say would add to his reputation or his stature, but he was an, an extraordinary Jew whose natural insights into Torah and its meaning and its spiritual purpose were absolutely transcendent. Then his ability to bring that to the force of the benefit of human beings uh, is certainly a piece of what stimulated my own interest in the civil rights movement. I think that when we talk about what's deficient or why things don't go as we think they should in the purpose of Torah, I always think that there is a lack of leadership. If we have more Heschels, the, uh, you know, beside rabbis who quail against the internet, we would have some leadership that would steer the people. Well, I think that, that it is the case that for much of the Orthodox community, uh, including for a significant segment of the modern Orthodox community, uh, the, the turn inward um, has remained so powerful that it has not allowed people who might intuit the need to move in that direction, has not allowed them to take that direction. And therefore you're quite Correct. There's a deficiency of leadership that would move us toward the recognition of our capacity to move beyond the confines of our own community. So, on the other side of the epiphany and discovering God, did you have any conflict or doubts about observance in Judaism in the earlier years and along since? You know, again, not in my early years. My early years were... Um, you know, relatively straightforward. My sense of, of the you know presence of Hakadosh Baruch Hu in, in, in my life was was always very strong. Um, on the other hand, in 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 the in my early years, in in Berkeley, um, there were certainly periods of time when the spiritual challenge was was great. Um, I was seeing a world that was very different from the sort of the enclosed world that I had. That had and how no, different it was, uh, and this is the, particularly uh, in Berkeley in the 1960s. Yes. Yeah. Was it the same time as Shlomo had his uh, House uh, of Love and Prayer? Um, Shlomo started his House of Love and Prayer uh, after an experience that he had in Berkeley, of which we were, we were a part. Uh, we were already there in Berkeley before the first time that Shlomo came. Uh, Shlomo came 
um, first to uh, to participate in a folk concert, and and he um, he asked us before beforehand if uh, he was going to be having dinner with us on Friday night, and he asked if on Friday morning when he would um, be doing a short uh, presentation up in Sproul Plaza, um, whether he could invite some people over to join us on Friday night. And we said sure, no no problem, and what we did not know was that. Uh, surrounded by a crowd of approximately 10,000 people. Uh, Shlomo said, and anyone who wants to continue singing with me tonight should come to the house of the <laughs> Holy Rabbi and the Holy Rebetzin. <laughs> and he announced our address, and, and, and we didn't know that. And so, you know, he was having dinner with us, and people began to trickle into our house, and eventually there were about 400 people <laughs> who were... <laughs> Right, so dancing in the streets, and that was the beginning of Shlomo's recognition that he had a that there was a constituency that he had there, uh, and it was clear that he there was a resonance between him and some of the flower people that was quite extraordinary, and that's when he decided to open the House of Love and Prayer. How was and your we, relationship with him? It was wonderful. In fact, we we were one of the there, there were only five Orthodox rabbis in the whole of Northern California at that time. And, and we worked very closely together as a group, and, and Shlomo asked for our help in developing the House of Love and Prayer, and, and we met and spoke about it and decided that this is an enormous contribution to, to Am Yisrael. And we were very supportive of him. We went to the house. His people came to our shuls when he was away. Uh, it was a very productive time, both for him and for the religious community. So this is also around the same time and the same topic that he was saying strained your religious conformity? Right. So, so I, I how, needed, you would, how would you describe Not it? my conformity. I, I, um, it was more a question of, of sort of the... the, the for as much as... No, for as much as, as, as Torah remained extraordinarily powerful for me... Um, I sort of went through a period of time when I had to experience what I was finding people experiencing, and that is people come to wholeness in Yadus through multiple paths. Some people have a natural kind of spiritual sense of the presence of God, and then they find Torah as an expression of that in their lives. Other people discover the beauty of the life of mitzvot, and then have to discover God as the spirit that resides behind that. So uh, I had grown up, you know, believing in God and, 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 and seeing the Torah as an expression of, of God's presence in the world. The more I, I was out in the world, the more I found myself in a life of mitzvot, in which God was less present. And I needed to rediscover God's presence through the mitzvot. Well, I think that the way I would understand it, projecting my set of eyes and ears, would be Rav Kuk is saying, if you're on a highway and you need to rush on a spiritual journey, jump on any spiritual <laughs> vehicle that goes faster than you. No, no. That, he, was, he was not encouraging that. He was, <laughs> understanding he, was, he, was, he, was, he was understanding that that's what people would naturally do. He got a lot of slack. But, yes, he got a lot of slack for that. For that's that. correct. Yeah. Do you think that Jewish family structure in America today has changed fundamentally? And is it affecting how our tradition and Jewish observance is being transmitted, transmitted or foretold to our children? And what are the consequences of the character of the family has obviously undergone enormous change over the course of, of these past decades. Um, anthropologists already early on um, by the 1970s were recognizing that the rapidity of change in society and in technology were gradually producing a shift within families a disruption. from a disruption from the normal process which had been present for millennia, namely that the cumulative wisdom of elders could always serve as the guide to the next generation, and that therefore the young generation always needed their parents, their grandparents, elders in the community as a way of providing them with a kind of guidance to meet situations that were common. But they point out that you know, that's 
effective so long as the social and economic realities are relatively constant. But that as the society began to change more rapidly, um, young people began to discover that their grandparents had grown up in a completely different world. And they therefore dismissed their experience. They have nothing to offer me because their life experience was different. They didn't even have radios. They didn't have cars. They didn't have anything. And then gradually they began to discover that even as the speed began to continue, that even their parents' experience was not similar, sufficiently similar to their own. And therefore everything came to be vested in the peer group. Thomas Friedman has this book, I forgot the name, where he says that when um, two objects drive in a slow speed, and if they deviate mildly, the gap between them won't be so far. Mm -hmm. You know, so if you're going one degree off at 20 miles per hour, in 10 days you'll be only maybe 10 feet apart. Mm -hmm. But when you drive at a thousand miles per hour, so society today is going so fast that any minor difference between parents and children or mm -hmm. any aspects in the society finds us at total different, opposite, strange distance from one another and the fragmentation and, and the separation and the um, conflict between generation although it doesn't stop children from asking for money from the parents but they don't ask for wisdom so please so, so i think with within the context of that awareness what orthodoxy has achieved is a set of strings of commonality that run through the generations uh, that serves to hold the generations together um, in a greater way than exists in the general society. Lower gear. So, no, it's not that those external changes are eliminated, but that there's Shabbat, there's Kashrut, there are f calendar experiences, uh, there are heightened spiritual moments, um, there, there, there is a learning of wisdom that people can recognize as constant. Yes, a continuity. And that that sense of continuity, if there are enough such strands, they form a cable yeah. that enables there to be continued communication and continued um, strength in the bond between the generations. It's obvious that we're using past experience to, to teach and lead and, and also save us from getting lost. Right. But Jews have been a big culprits in social change mm -hmm. and social activism, especially the 20th century. As a social activist yourself, you were involved in many um, social issues such as mm -hmm. civil rights, Soviet Jewry, finding the just role for women's halakhic standing. How and why did you get involved? Because it's not exactly using our old steady wisdom to keep us in track. It's the other side yeah. of... I mean, for me, the, the activism that I was beginning to express uh, in relation to Soviet Jewry, um, around the same time that I was beginning to be active in, in civil rights in the early 1960s, uh, that activism for me emerged unequivocally from my Jewish conscience. Uh, it did not emerge from liberal political ideologies. Uh, it did not emerge from uh, secular influences. Uh, it, it really, you know, when I uh, mentioned before these narratives about Moshe uh, and the fact that, that, um, uh, that, that Moshe um, even used violence as one means of, of achieving um, uh, justice. Uh, that, that in another, he used speech. In the third, he doesn't use either violence or speech, but he, his presence uh, in, in the story of, of Yitro's daughters, we, the Torah doesn't tell us what he did. It just tells us that he was there and that somehow his presence resolved the, the, the conflict. Um, that there are a variety of different circumstances of different needs, but that the fundamental responsibility for seeing to justice is very powerful. I took that not only from Moshe, but 
early on, um, uh, at least in, in my you know in my twenties, um, in in the nineteen sixties, uh, as, as I studied Rambam, Murnavuchim, um, uh, and and sort of worked through the third book of the of the guide, uh, where the Rambam argues that the whole of Torah has three central purposes, that every single mitzvah shares in one or more of the following central purposes, either to teach us some truth or to avoid our believing in a falsehood, because if we walk in the ways of falsehood, we will destroy ourselves and the world, or secondly, to cultivate within us particular virtues or to aid us in avoiding um, vices, uh, so that that's why the Torah teaches us that we have to love and not hate. Uh, or thirdly, to achieve justice in the society in which we live. So I, I think that the, 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 the Rambam understood that you know, these three are interwoven, they're interlocked, and that the whole of Torah is linked to these three goals. And that you can't achieve social justice if it's based on falsehood. You can't cultivate noble personality qualities if you're engaged in injustice, right? That, that the three need to be cultivated all at the same time. And that's the, the, the great, the, the magnificent gift of Torah is precisely that it enables us to live a life in which there's balance amongst those three so that they reinforce each other and they, they produce hopefully what Israel as a nation will produce in its evolving balance. So at one or another point in time, there may be greater, balance, greater emphasis on justice or there may be greater emphasis on truth or greater emphasis on, on whatever it is, but that the balance amongst those three as a coherent approach to life is essential. That's why, as I hear you, I think that the irony, there is some argument in the Talmud um, about Akum, and they say that being a Jew is an obligation, it's not a privilege. <laughs> Therefore, there's a lot of rulings that, um, right. that come from the fact that being a Jew is not really such a privilege. Well, it, it, it's easier for <laughs> Akum to stay Akum than it's, to... Well, it's, than to it's, 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 cer it's certainly it's not privilege. just privileges, <laughs> but you know, that was one of the major contributions of, of Torah to, to world society, which it's just beginning to recognize now, and that is that civil society has to be based on duties, not on rights. In conclusion, you had tremendous impact both as an activist uh, with actions in the physical world, you also as a thinker and an educator acting through more subtle message. And I know all of these aspects are intertwined, but what is more satisfying, being active in the trenches or reaching new heights in thinking or in teaching the next generation? It's an unfair question because, first of all, at different points in my life, different elements of those have occupied greater significance for me. Um, and secondly, because the reality is that I, I try always to seek some balance amongst those elements. And so even when I'm, um, you know, when I'm primarily involved in, in academic work, I, I, I try to use myself in ways that... that foster social social responsibilities and and i i um and, and at different points in life you know in 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 our in in, in the life of my family uh, there are points at which my family has to take priority over other kinds of activities and other times when i'm f more freed to engage in those other activities um, I, I i really believe that people have to find the path that is most gratifying for them as individuals, that people don't have the right to simply say, this piece of life is sufficient for me in, in fulfilling my Jewish identity, uh, that they always have to be able to balance the components. So there are people who always complain that it's not fair for other reasons. For instance, there are people who wish to have been in Israel in the time of the Chalutzim, and they missed it, you know? And there are people who say, oh, to have been a Jew in the 1960s, I would have been on the civil rights movement and Soviet juries in the 80s, I would have been there. And they say, well, today we don't have those big flags. What do you say to people? Is it a more subtle 
uh, new ones or is, no. are there big movements that we are missing that will always our kids are going to say we should we be in Europe you. that's right I, I think for example that the children of people who are growing up now will ask them what they did to resolve the problems of poverty in the world will ask them what they did to from wherever they are in the world um, to help secure the The well-being of the state of Israel or the that, environment for that matter or the, the environment there is no shortage of issues but of, the, that will have an enormous impact on the future of the world and on the future of our grandchildren and great-grandchildren and again I don't think that any one person has to solve all the problems of the world or can solve all the problems of the world and that's why the teaching of Reptarfon you know that, that, that you don't have to solve all the problems of the world but But that you're not permitted to walk away from it just because you know you can't solve all the problems just because you can't complete the task doesn't mean that you shouldn't assume responsibility for some piece of the task the fact is there are more slaves in the world today than there have ever been the reality is that that we are endangering the survival of humanity by the way in which we are mistreating nature and The reality is that there are still millions of people every year who die of starvation. The reality is that Israel lives a fragile existence despite its enormous power and its enormous successes. Uh, the reality is that the Jewish community of the United States is weakening intensely through the lack of Jewish education for the vast majority of Jews of the United States. And the lack of opportunity for exciting spiritual experience uh, any one of these problems okay so if you child or your grandchild mm-hmm. came to you and he, he said tell me one thing that they can do it's not fair to say that we can there are so many things each one of them is a law law is, is a universe by itself it, the reason Soviet jury was so attractive is that it could It really converged all Jewish efforts to a manageable, even though it was impossible. It was something that we could name, we could point. There was a geography to it. There were specific people to it. Like if there is a Pidion Shvoyim, we're talking it's one person who has been taken hostage. But if you talk about poverty in general, you, you can't do it. So what is the problem? The point that you would say to your child today go there be my shaliach in doing which I would not presume to tell any individual person not even my children or grandchildren that this one task amongst all of those is the one that at this point in time is the most central of them all I think that each person has to look within themselves and see what it is that speaks to them most of That is most likely to sustain and to nourish and sustain their spiritual and material lives um, and, and that's the activity that they have to engage in if they find that it's not gratifying they need to find something else but the, the, every individual I think has to search out the piece of that and within within each one of those within each one of those major challenges there are dozens of pieces that And dealing with poverty you know could range from anything from giving out sandwiches to people who are hungry or, or helping to, to organize food drives in their own community there's one woman who at Lincoln Square synagogue already since the mid 1980s has been the key person in in the collection of, of, of bread from a particular bakery on the lower East side that she arranges to have delivered to 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 um, uh, to to, to To places where people need uh, to, to get food and and I think that you know it's been extraordinary for her in her life and for the achievement of that purpose it's amazing what the power of one is mm-hmm. is capable of doing but I, I want to just shift to other areas Rabbi do you see yourself as a modern Orthodox Jew and with so many moving to the right has this definition changed? There has never been a clear definition of modern orthodoxy. Modern orthodoxy has essentially been an attempt to describe uh, the Orthodox community in its acceptance of modernity um, and in its connection to modernity. So I have attempted 
to, uh, to define a specific set of elements, which I consider to be the elements of modern orthodoxy, not in their totality, uh, but in the s- variety of forms of connection to modernity. So I think that the valuing of secular knowledge and secular education is an essential element in modern orthodoxy. I believe that the acceptance of the religious significance of the birth of the State of Israel is essential. I believe that the recognition of the justice and the aspiration of, of women for greater role in Talmud Torah and in positions of leadership is an essential element of modern orthodoxy. Um, and I believe that uh, not viewing Chumrah as uh, an essential um, uh, uh, element in spiritual growth uh, is, is itself important within modern orthodoxy. Uh, th- there are these elements, and I, I think that there's no question that I view myself as a modern Orthodox Jew. Uh, I do not accept most of the Haredi alternatives to those ideological positions. Um, and and I, I, you know, I, I view myself as being uh, at the center of what modern Orthodoxy is, despite all of the fluctuations that have been taking place. There seems to be a wedge pushed between the words modern and Orthodox today. Uh, why you used to be the bastion of modern orthodoxy, but it has moved to the right from those days. Do you think there is a shadow of legitimacy that the Haredi world, with its hegemony on true orthodoxy via its political role in Israel, imposes on modern orthodoxy today? Um, no. I, I think that um, there is there's always a fluctuation in the way in which communities live their religious and spiritual experience. Uh, I think the Haredi community, particularly in the United States, but even in Israel, is itself undergoing changes, um, changes that are opening them to greater participation in the general society, and that will produce other results as well. I believe it's already producing uh, results here in the United States in which there is a, a cadre of young uh, Haredi professionals, uh, and people who are engaged fully in the world, uh, who have a different perspective on, on many of the issues that previously defined Haredi Judaism, and that it will take some time for those to play themselves out on a communal level. Uh, they are moving closer to modern orthodoxy, and I believe that there is a segment of the modern orthodox community which took cognizance of the fact that for much of modern orthodoxy, uh, their adherence to halakha was, um, was, was, not, was, was not stable and, and was not intense, and that they are therefore moving more toward that kind of stability without necessarily giving up the ideological components of modern orthodoxy. So I see us as a... You You're know, hope in the future. I, I think there's a lot of flux. I have an enormous hope for the future, because I, I truly believe that the ideology of modern Orthodox will, will be a dominant form um, of, of Judaism in the century to come. I think we are just now beginning to come out of the shadow of the Holocaust. And as we emerge from the sha- shadow of the Holocaust, there will be a reorientation of enormous significance, and that in that reorientation, Modern Orthodoxy will play a, a criti- an absolutely critical role. Judaism, in many ways, is an evolving religion and a tradition in some areas, but in other areas it's frozen and unchanging. For instance, all religions set boundaries between men and women, but this has been an ancient tradition based on unbridgeable differences. Yet today's women fill up almost all men's role including in the Haredi world, where most women work to support their families. Many people identify you with the struggle of Jewish women to find a more involved place in Jewish observance, a halachic blessing over a more egalitarian role in a changing world. Can you talk about it? Well, I think that it is absolutely correct that um, uh, over the course of history, uh, the, 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 the understanding within halacha and within the living culture of, uh, of, of, the, of the Jewish community committed, fully committed to halacha, uh, 
has seen uh, a great deal of, of fluctuation. A great deal of that has been dependent upon the realities of the community within which Jews have found themselves. And so, whereas in, in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in Spanish uh, Jewry of the, of the uh, 12th and 13th century, uh, they were able to conceive of the possibility that men should not even hear women speaking, whereas in Ashkenaz they had no objection to women speaking, but they had objection to women singing. Um, and and the, in the Provence there was an attempt to sort of bring those two together around a set of principles related to issues of what kinds of circumstances would create the kind of sexual impropriety that the community needed to avoid. And, you know, and, and that shifted, all of that shifted over the course of time. So there are constant principles. The implementation of those constant principles often vary over the course of time. Um, and we, are, we now live in an era of time in which women have entered the society at a level much fuller and much more engaged than ever before in, in human history. And it is reasonable to assume that that same pattern uh, will gradually evolve within even the Orthodox community. But the Orthodox community will attempt to be defensive of the underlying values that it wants to preserve, the underlying values in the relationship between men and women. The community does not want to see the kind of egalitarian orientation in which non-marital sexuality is completely free. Uh, in which adultery is tolerated, um, uh, in, in which, in fact, adultery is, is promulgated as a, as a perfectly acceptable activity within the society, which has happened here in the United States. So we're talking about women learning Torah. What does that have to do no, no. with any, sexuality? Because any shift in, in, any shift in, in status, particularly in regard to the role of women, raises those fundamental questions always have and always will. And the question will be, can the community demonstrate that there are reasonable changes that can be implemented without threatening the fundamental structures? That's why the gradualness, I believe, the gradualness of the shift in regard to women engaged in Talmud Torah has been extraordinarily important. So the fact that it's, it's only 40 years ago that Rav Soloveitchik gave that first drasha the, the first year at, at the Beit Midrash that we had started at Stern College for the study of Gemara, but it's 40 years later. During that period of time, Rav Salavechik, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, uh, and Rabar and Lichtenstein, all of them, Zichronam Levracha, you know, began to work at and evolved a conceptual change that validated the affirmative value of the activity of women being engaged in Torah, and the community developed mechanisms by which that could be achieved without destabilizing the society. Um, so I so think, I think it, that will continue. It you, will continue. You, you spoke before about how the old is used as uh, paving the road and also guiding the, bound, mm -hmm. the boundaries exactly. to protect us. And yet it also... It, uh, fights change yes, that's sometimes true. when it's necessary and the Hasidut and the Rambam and now women's roles are all movements that were successful eventually but what is puzzling is that when the, the all the um, right wing the Haredi who warn against fear of change because they said look what happened to you know it is the least faithful statement of a religious observant Jew. Because it says that we, men, can corrupt God's world, and when in all other aspects we're supposed to be courageous to do God's work. So if you are faithful and you know that something is the right thing to do, don't you think God is going to make the right thing happen? No. No. No, I mean, it is often the case that people out of perfectly righteous motives produce great evil. Um, and I think that, you know... How do you protect? Let's say maybe your work to help women can be unconstrued to produce 
That's correct. Evil, and but no... you, it's not going to stop you from doing what you think is a just, That's social right. justice. That's correct. But what it will produce for me is a sense of recognition that those who are resisting are not resisting out of evil motives. That those who are resisting those changes may be misled because they are fearful of, of, change. of change and they are fearful that evil will result and that I need to respect their fears as I move the line gradually forward because I believe that they will gradually accept the demonstration that we can achieve these goals without the disruption, without fundamental disruption of the character of the, of the strengths and values of our community. And I'm, I'm not willing to say that those people who, even, who criticized me for, uh, you know, for some of the positions I took in regard to questions of, of, of Kolisha, my article on Kolisha, which I still stand, you know, stand behind. Uh, there were many who criticized me for that. And, and the references in, in, in my article on the status of women in halakha uh, to, to, to the fundamental permissibility of women wearing tefillin, and there were those who criticized me for that. I, I'm, I'm not, I don't think that they were, motive, at least most of them, I don't think they were motivated by any you know, fundamentally you know, wrongful, evil motives. I, I think they were motivated by the sense that I was promoting something that could create a destabilization of the community, which, as I pointed out before, which in this particular era is distinctively dangerous. So I think that had the Hassam Sofer um, not lived in, in the late uh, 1700s, when he did live, uh, had he not had to confront the rise of the reform movement, that he would not have opposed giving drashot in the vernacular instead of in Yiddish that he would not have opposed the movement of the bima from the center of the synagogue, right? I mean, there are a variety of things that, that people do in the context of the challenges that they are confronting that they see as the threatening the destabilization of their community. Like the internet today in the Haredi. Exactly. So I respect that. I try to move against it in as gentle a way as possible, but to move against it. To, to, because I believe that, that the, the correct line needs to be evolved over the course of time within the parameters of Torah, not outside those parameters. Interesting, you mentioned before Provence, which actually is the closest to Ashkenazi world where Rambam had strong influences, mm -hmm. and you mentioned the Rambam before, and the Rambam is the hero for many of us modern Orthodox, and yet when you read about the Rambam and you find that he was the most anti-woman's lib That's of right. any Jew ever. We don't know the name of his <laughs> mother, we don't know the name of his wife, and he had strong, uh, strong stance against women's rights. At the same token, he was the most revolutionary Jew since the Talmud era. So he, he went against everything. So what I've never understood the people excuse him because he lived in the Muslim world. But he was a revolutionary against everything except women's role in, in Judaism. See, I don't see that the same way. I don't think that he was anti-feminist. I think that um, he was driven by a deep sense of the power of the sexual drive and that any issue that had to do with um, sexuality he both philosophically and halachically believed that there should be fences yeah. built around sexual expression. On the other hand, I believe that the Rambam in regard to the economic protection of women um, was as progressive as anybody is today. I think that the Rambam in regard to the question of the protection of women's right to get a divorce upon demand was more radical than anybody today. Uh, I believe that the Rambam in the fundamental areas of the rights of women, I think that the Rambam in regard to the question of whether women could be judges um, takes a position that is more, um, not quite as fully affirmative as a minority position in Ashkenaz, but was open to that possibility. 
Uh, I think that the Rambam in regard to Eidus is yeah. open to a variety. In other words, I, I don't yeah. think that the Rambam can fairly be described as anti-feminist. I think that, that the, the issue of sexuality for the Rambam, partly because of his philosophical conviction that the sexual drive was so powerful that it would override all other drives for good, whatever reason he had that perspective. So yes, I think that he insisted on a certain degree of, of separation of, of men and women, but I, I don't think that that was a fully, sort of full-blown anti-feminist position. Few miles north of Provence, Rashi taught his daughter's Torah, not... Do you know he... Rashi's mother's name? No. Do you know his wife's name? No. So why are you complaining about not knowing those about the Rambam? Well, because he didn't have any other redeeming sites. Rashi taught Torah to his daughters. So the Rambam, the Rambam was the one who, who insisted that the teaching of Rebbe Yezabin, of Rebbe Yezabin Azaria, that Kalam Lame Bita Torah Lamda Tiflus, the Rambam was the one who clearly insisted that that was an advisory judgment and not halacha. And he, in turn, was precisely the one who had established with clarity, because of his use of a particular term in the Mishnah Torah, had established with clarity that notion which enabled the Chafetz Chaim to support the growth of the Beis Yaakov movements and which enabled Rav Soloveitchik and the Lubavitcher Rebbe to argue that there is no Isser at all against women studying Torah Shaval Peh. Thank you for helping me. I never would have gotten to it by myself. Okay. And I hope other people understand that. You wrote that the expansion of women's role is viewed as a threat to the stability of the culture of Jewish families okay. and rabbinic leadership. Thus, it is working very hard to suppress it. Okay. You're known for being very active at Eda. Is that what happened there? The conflict between the forces against women's role? That is a constant issue. It has been evident from the early 1960s as the women's movement began to emerge, uh, certainly in 1971 when you had the first, um, first conference of, of, of Jewish women, which took place here in the city of, of, of New York. Is that Jofa? Uh, you know, before Jofa was organized, Jofa was then organized subsequently. From that moment in time, it was clear to people in the Haredi community that the issue of feminism had the potential to be a disruptive force, and it was emerging precisely at a very delicate moment in the, in, in the, in the uh, growth of orthodoxy. Right, the early 1960s, the Haredi community um, was just beginning to peek its nose out of the cloud of the Holocaust, able to see that maybe the development of yeshivot could be a powerful mechanism. Maybe it was possible for Lakewood to be more than just a center for 35 Talmidim. Um, maybe it would be possible for, for something like Dafyomi to really take off in America. There's, these were just the beginnings, and they saw the rise of feminism as a potentially disruptive force, and so they resisted it. You know, it's interesting, we're talking about the role of women just at the time where the Me Too movement is mm -hmm. emerging, and, right. uh, and, and it's uh, quite critical. Is this part of an accomplishment of the role of women in general in society, and therefore it will affect... Um, the Jewish world as well? Is that kind of the movements in society that have a strong impact? On a certain level, I think that the Me Too you know, emergence uh, is precisely a reaction to the sexual libertinism uh, that has uh, been victorious in American society uh, from the early 1960s and until now. That libertinism, while it granted the liberty to women um, to emerge in positions of leadership in society and to gain equality in many professions, carried with it also a, a, uh, a, a rejection of any sexual constraints. It assumed that whatever you want to do sexually, you can do. And thereby, it, it allowed for a level of, of abusiveness in the sexual relationship. Against women. Against women. Of abuse of women because... Anyone who said that you could not do something, whatever you wanted to do sexually, was then uh, opposed to the modern spirit. Right. And it's only now that women in particular are beginning to realize, hey, you know, we've created a monster. 
We've created not sexual liberty, we've created sexual libertinism in which anything can ha- anything has to be defined as acceptable and that therefore male abuse of women has to be accepted because that's it's a sexual liberty and right and now they're realizing that that's stupid right they didn't do it I, I think the the finding an outlet for women to be able to be free and dress how they want it was not saying I invite you to do whatever you want to me but that's the way that, that it was understood. It's not libertarianism in an <laughs> ideological way. It's really the animalistic thing, meaning exactly. I going out of my of my hole mm-hmm. and not being afraid to be killed anymore doesn't mean that I'm inviting you to 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 do me harm. But, but that's but that's exactly what happens. So it's a progress. It, you see what again from from my perspective, the, the absence of clearly defined boundaries means that people will give full vent to their animalistic tendencies. Right. And w- what happened from the early 1960s until now was that the society essentially said anything goes in the sexual realm. And if anything goes, if there are no boundaries, then, eh, then men can do what they want. Women can do what they want, right? I, but I can, I, you know, I'm a man, I can do what I want, right? And uh, women did not want to do what men were doing because they have a sort of a more natural kind of sense of, of restraint in regard to these matters. But men didn't have that sense of restraint, and therefore the, the animal emerged. And now there's the beginnings of a pushback against that, which is a healthy pushback against it. The New York Times yesterday, I, I, I heard the National Gallery is holding back an exhibit of Chuck Close, a portrait. Now, you know, but is there an end to it? So... I, I remember an article that I read, uh, I think Jonathan Sachs uh, wrote about the difference between shame cultures and guilt cultures. Mm-hmm. And I think a voice such as yours and others can help to put the boundaries where the pendulum can swing and hit back a lot of other people. Not a thing that Chuck Close is uh, good or Picasso was a great person. They did a lot of wrong, but where does it stop? A lot of people are asking where does it stop and the reason of shame versus guilt, uh, just to clarify, shame means that whoever does wrong, it goes on him. Mm-hmm. He cannot ever be redeemed and guilt means that the act is wrong and you can be yeah. asking forgiveness. Remember um, who was the swagger and Baker mm-hmm. went in front of the whole congregation mm-hmm. and they cried, mm-hmm. please forgive me and they were forgiven. Mm-hmm. There is a redemption. Is there a redemption? For people who were abusers? It depends on sort of the nature of the injury that people caused. It depends on, on the, the, the consistency of it. And, and it depends on whether it seems to have reflected a kind of, 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 of evil within them uh, that is not easily forgiven and not easily overcome. I think that this swing that takes place in these areas is going to have to play itself out. And that in that swing, there are lots of people who, you know, who, who are moderately bad, who are going to get hurt very badly as a result of that. And that, that's, an, uh, I think, an unavoidable consequence of the social swing uh, that, that's now taking place. You know, South Africa uh, tried to, 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 balance. Uh, to, to balance those and allow people to sort of confess and, and then resume some kind of a role in society. You're talking about truth yes, and reconciliation. Yes. Right. We should so, have it for, for women's abusers. Some of them, but some of them you know, are simply criminals and, and need to be, you know, there's a difference between, you know, truth in regard to, well, there are different levels of wrongfulness. Right. I, right. Yeah. Going back on the role of women, I spoke to Rabbi Roth and... He had a very interesting angle when in 83 he wrote his paper about uh, in favor ordination mm-hmm. of, of women and he basically had a creative way his paper was he wrote that the whole difference about the role of women in the minion and others is because they are not obligated to all mitzvahs. Mm-hmm. Once they take upon themselves the obligation of all mitzvahs they see them they are basically in, for the purpose of Minion and others, they are just like a man. Is it too creative a way, or is it really something you endorse? No, it's not something that I endorse, and, and uh, even the conservative movement has essentially moved away from it in consequence of, of his position 
um, you know, in the early years of the ordination of women, women were required to take a neder that they would in fact fulfill all of the mitzvot from which they are pturot. Um, I, I sort of began to explore that already in the, in the 1970s. In fact, the first article that was ever published in tradition written by a woman was written by a woman named Arlene Pianko on the question of whether the constancy of the Jewish practice by women to hear Tchiat Shofar would produce a notion of chiyuv in relation to them, to which the answer was, despite the fact that women had been fulfilling the mitzvah of shofar already pretty systematically for, for millennia, um, it remained something that was patur and not chiyuv. That is, essentially what happens in Jewish law is that um, rights and duties are assigned by status, not by individual choice not by what jurists would call, not by contract. And, and so while I, I do, in fact, think that the, uh, the inability of women to be counted for a minyan and their inability to, uh, to, 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 to be shliach tzibur uh, is, in fact, based on a notion of reciprocal rights and duties, and that since women are, were not um, duty-bound to participate in tefillah tzibur, um, and were not duty bound to do tefillah in precisely the same way as, as men, that that results in the lack of their privilege, that they don't have the privilege to lead those services and to be motzi men in those obligations. Um, but I don't think that uh, women simply voluntarily assuming those obligations will make a difference, which is why I don't, I mean, I, I just picked up a copy of the, the new book by Ethan Tucker on, on um, uh, egalitarianism within tefillah for women. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll read it. I've read some of the earlier things that he's written about this. Um, I don't think that it will um, uh, be persuasive, but I'll, I'll see what it, what it does. I do not think that full and perfect egalitarianism can be achieved within the framework of Jewish law. How about uh, the... Ordaining women at Maharat or, or such? I, I don't believe that there is any barrier to, or to, to, to affirming that women have the capacity to uh, make judgments of Jewish law. Therefore, I think that women you know, should be able to receive smicha of yora yora. The question of how long it will take the community to accept what particular roles is now what's in negotiation. Uh, the title will be in negotiation and the specific elements of the role will be in negotiation. At some point, it will resolve itself. The last topic that I'll touch on is, you know, there are bridges sometimes that are built, and there's a toll to pay for the bridge. Mm -hmm. And then when they paid for them, the toll st still stays mm -hmm. and serves the taxes are paid, you know, toll. So if Judaism was built as Orla Goyim, Okay. One can argue that Judaism already has done its job, and not that it finished, but the trend of civil rights for women, for slavery, for property, that maybe the role of Jews, of Judaism, as tikkun olam or lagoim, has ended and, and just to end it, can Judaism exist in the realm of an idea? rather than an observance. Yuri Zelinsky argues in his book, The Jewish Century, that modern age is a Jewish age, and the 20th century in particular is a Jewish century. The biggest influence on the 20th century be it socialism, civil rights, science and literature with, of Jewish influence, but not Jewish religious yeah. people. If our role is light upon the nation, do we still have to wait three hours between meat and milk to do so? Let me come back to what I had indicated was the the uh, teaching of the Rambam in, in Book 3 of The Guide to the Perplexed. And that is that uh, the Torah addresses fundamentally the human condition. The Torah is like a, a guidebook for the human body and mind and soul in the real world. Uh, its purpose is not just to teach random rules. Um, its purpose is, is not just to constrain us from you know, falling off the end of the earth. Uh, 
its purpose has to do with the innate nature of the human being, of who we are. And that never changes. That is, you know, technology always builds on the prior technology. Um, Human virtues start all over again with every new baby born into the world. It's amazing. Wisdom is not transmitted. That's right. When you're born... The genes don't carry grade school education, (laughs) despite the fact that everybody uh, has been educated in grade school. All lessons. It, It does not carry wisdom. Genes don't carry wisdom. Wisdom, the transmission of wisdom and the transmission of values requires the renewal of that process in every generation. Every set of parents has to be the bearers of that process. That's exactly why the Torah is eternal, because it addresses the most fundamental processes of what it means to become human. In order to become human, we need to learn what's true and false in the world. Right, right. In in order to become human, we have to know that there are virtues that are really important to be cultivated, and we have to, from infancy, be cultivated into those virtues. Because that's not just a matter of hearing that kindness is good and then being kind. You have to be raised by parents and by a community which lives a life of kindness. Right. And, and that's how the, the value becomes transmitted. It's a and justice it doesn't just flow. Justice has to be modeled in the society by the way in which parents relate to their children, by the way in which teachers relate to their students, by the way in which merchants relate to their customers, by the way in which customers relate to their merchants, by the way in which people relate to each other in the street when they meet each other, all of those create the building blocks for justice within the society and justice within the world. And therefore, the regulation of those activities and the insistence that people use themselves in a way which manifests those truths and those virtues and and those elements of social justice is always essential. We can't escape, we can't escape that. And rules are an instrument for achieving it. They're not the only instrument for achieving it. But rules are an essential element in the way in which we achieve those aspirations that we have. This is the best answer for the eternity of Torah that I ever heard. And it's not built on halachot or like, the, you know, the big finger of what may happen. It's the best answer. And it also defines another thing because the lack of transmission of wisdom may educate us about what Olama Bai is, where you have eternal wisdom rather than renewed wisdom. That's right. But on that, I, I have a lied. I have one more question and I'm going to be gone. Okay. So in the rabbinic period, they had to contend with a tremendous challenge, a transformation between a temple generation, where Jewish life was centered around the temple, and future generations where they didn't have the temple anymore. And they really, literally renewed and you could say reinvented Jewish practice or Jewish observance, right? Our generation must formulate Judaism to people without books. I'm a sefer, lost the sefer. Instead of text, we have a text. You know, without a shtetl, we're free to go anywhere. And are we not in a similar transformative and challenging way? Don't we have the obligation to be courageous and to change, even though we fear change? Maybe it's like uh, when you go in an army, you have to take a risk when you have a battle. So I believe that the transformation that took place after the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash was actually an attempt to carry the values and virtues of the Beit HaMikdash into the new circumstance. It was not an abandonment of the Beit HaMikdash. It was an attempt to say, well, what were these karbanot really about? Well, these karbanot were an attempt to praise God. They were an attempt to communicate our own deficiencies, to take cognizance of our own deficiencies and and to seek out God's aid in transcending those deficiencies. And they were about expression of gratitude to God. That's what all of the karbanot were about. So we don't have the karbanot anymore, 
So let's develop a way of doing that in words. And that's what became the Amidah. So it wasn't that the Beit HaMikdash was abandoned and that some whole new, a new Judaism arose. It was just the, tre- the, the change of the medium, but not of the message. So I see one of the central challenges for this new era uh, being a challenge that uh, we have not yet begun to meet. And that is the introduction of holiness into productivity. That is, I believe that holiness is essentially the attempt to implement in the real world all of the midot of chesed of Hashem. Like the 13 names of God, which are the divine qualities of kindness, of humanity, of justice, of, 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 of forgiveness, of, of, of productivity, of, of partnership, of all of these values that are in here in the divine names. Holiness is the attempt to implement those in the real world. And that's what the law, the law is, a, the halakha is an attempt to do that. The halakha is a way in which we are given the opportunity to implement God's virtues and values in the real world. Now, the Torah itself laid out a way to do that, not just when you're in shul, right? Not just when you're in the mikdash, but in the daily productive life of every individual. So the Torah did that by taking the core mode of productivity, which was agriculture. So the Torah said, okay, when you're engaged in your agriculture, you know, when you're plowing up the field and you're going to be using animals, you, you can't link a shore and a chamor together because it will injure one or the other and you have to be concerned. In your productivity, you have to be concerned with the well-being of animals, right? And then when you plant the seeds, you have to not mingle different species of seeds, Because in your very productive act, you have to be aware that God is the creator of the universe, not you. That you're being productive, but God is the creator of the universe. And then in your ownership of crops, you have to leave stuff for the poor. Why? Because in your productive activity, not, not in your spare time, in your productive activity, you have to be concerned with the poor and the effect that it has on them. And when you throw up your, your, your grain so that the wind will blow off the shaft, you have to be careful where the road is. So because you have to be careful in your productivity that your productivity will not injure other people. So what the Torah did is, through the laws that regulated the essential productive activity of people, it created a way that they should be aware that they need to be concerned in their productivity, not in their spare time. In their productivity, they have to be aware of the well-being of animals. They have to be aware of God as the creator of the universe. They have to be aware that people might be injured by what they're doing. Therefore, they have to really assume responsibility for that. They have to be aware that there are poor people who need to be taken care of. What we've done in this capitalist economy is we've severed out all of those qualities. That's for the voluntary organizations. But corporations only have to worry about one thing, profit. profit. Right? And and that's what's producing extraordinary evil in the world. Actually, the head of BlackRock came out in Davos and he said, you control $6 trillion worth of investment. And he said, our role is for social justice in the world. That's right. So there's a beginning of an awareness. But what they're doing in that beginning of awareness is saying, the money that we earn should, in our spare time, be used to help all of these other people. And what holiness and productivity means is that when you manufacture a product, you have to ask yourself, could people be injured by this product? And if they could be injured by this product, how do I make sure that people are not going to be injured by this product? In your productivity, you have to be asking yourself, could what I do uh, cause damage to nature? And if it does, then part of my responsible productivity is to make sure that it doesn't have that effect. Not to alienate all of that, because what we've done essentially is alienated our values from the majority of the time of our lives. If people spend, as they do now today, between 8 and 12 hours a day 
in their productive lives, and then they've got a couple of hours to sleep and to eat and to, to live with their family, then it means that 8 to 12 hours a day have nothing to do with values and nothing to do with God. And that's intolerable. And I think what we need to do is, that's, I think that that's a, a major contribution that Torah still has to make to the world, is to teach people how to have a different perspective on the productive process in its entirety. That's a great answer. The question that I had is, in the change from temple uh, practice right. to new practice, they employed right. new technology, exactly. which was bonding books, That's actually. Right. So yeah. today, digital media can be our next That's correct. thing. They show, so we shouldn't be afraid that the iPhone... We should be the, afraid. We should definitely be afraid. I mean, look at what's happening. People are now addicted to their iPhones, yeah, but, right? And, and, and the stuff that's available on the iPhones, you know, a substantial percentage of that is corruptive, right? right? So, you know, we should be afraid of the iPhone, but we also have to recognize its Use potential. It. Yeah, we and then we have it. to marshal its potential in ways, as in anything else in life, we have to marshal the potential of the new technology to, 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 for good and to reduce its capacity to do evil. Good place to end. I have just one request that I ask all my <laughs> rabbis, and that is to sing something from Beit Abba, from a tish of your family, or something meaningful as a nigun that played a role in your life. I have a, we have a grandson who's unfortunately very ill. And um, whenever Sorry. I visit him, I, 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 sing, um, I sing to him. And I always include uh, Hamalacha Goelosi. And it remains a very powerful force in my awareness. Hamalacha Goelosi. Hamalacha Goelosi Mikolra. Yevareches Haniarim. Vikarevahem Shuni. Hamalach ha-go-el-o-si Hamalach ha-go-el-o-si Mikolra Yevareches ha-ne-arim Vikarevahem shuni V'shem avosai V'shem avosai Avraham v'yitzchak Vid Gularov, Vid Gularov, the care of hearts. Why isn't Yaakov mentioned that? Because it's Yaakov who's speaking. Right. It's Yaakov's Tfila. Yes, and he has the 12 challenging children. Right. So there's a transition from patriarchal family to a nation. Right. Thank you so okay. very much.